Hey guys, it's Ethan. So in this episode, we're going to be talking to Cody Wellema of the Wellema Hat Company. He's a great friend of mine. He's a menswear enthusiast. He's a vintage enthusiast, and he creates some of the most beautiful, high-quality, bespoke fedoras that I've ever seen. Um, you'll notice in the episode that we have some like small audio issues. It's mainly because we accidentally recorded um, on the wrong setting. We shared one microphone, and we put it, I think, on stereo instead of interview mode. So it kind of picks up the entire room. And uh, it, I think it focuses more on Cody, which is good, uh, but Spencer and I are kind of like in the background. But you can still hear us, so it's not that big of a deal, but uh, definitely for the future, we will pay more attention to which uh, setting that we're on. Um, because, you know, it's an interview, you know, it's a lot of it is, you know, just question and answer, but I do have a special blog post about Cody that's up on the website. That's on Street Expressa. That's uh, Street X. And s p r e z z a dot wordpress dot com. That's our main blog, and over there, you know, I talk more about my personal relationship with Cody. Um, I kind of get into more of the details of what he talks about, as long as well as I show a lot of pictures. You know, because it's a fashion podcast, so of course, having pictures of what we're talking about, like he talks about, like the the some like hat devices that he uses to approximate the best uh size for your client for his clients so that's all up there and you can also see like his hats his shop and his great outfits that we we reference in the episode so yeah i hope you enjoy this new episode of style and direction A menswear podcast without the stuffiness this is your host Ethan Wong, and I'm Spencer Adi. And today we are joined by my friend Cody Wellema. Mm-hmm. He actually lives like five or he doesn't live. Oh well, yeah, I think you live five minutes away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, the store itself is uh, five minutes from my house. He's been uh, how long have you been in the store, Cody? Um, so I started the company in 2013 and was making hats a little bit before then. So whatever that math equates to, five. Five years? Five years. Something, five years. Like Something like that. Something like that. Like that. Wow. Yeah. And, and like since then, I mean, I remember when you started, we started following each other, you had like a little bit of followers and now mm-hmm. you have like, four, I think like 14,000, I think something, something like, like that. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, we thought uh, it would be, it would be interesting to kind of talk to you. Like, cause we, we talked about this in the last episode. Mm-hmm. We think we've exhausted everything that we can talk about by ourselves. <laughs> yes. Right, right, right. It's about time we had a guest and having mm-hmm. Cody here. Was a, is a good uh, first foray into you know, yeah. doing, doing interviews. Honored to be here. And so right now we are uh, we are live on Instagram. This is mostly for the people who are watching us. Yep. If you guys have any questions, please. Yeah, please put it down here. Yeah, we'll uh, take a look at them. Um, if the audio is a little bit off, that's because we're kind of experimenting with how to do... We're having one microphone. Uh, and so we're just gonna all crowd it around. We apologize. Like half of the episodes we've had have had a lot of audio <laughs> issues. So actually, the the one right before this is like the best. The one. best one. It's and then all came out clear. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, why don't we just get started? I know Spencer Spencer is a journalism major. Yeah. Mm. That is college, correct. So I'm letting him uh, take the reins on this. One. Okay. So here we go. Let's jump right in here. Yeah. So uh, you already kind of talked about this a little bit right at the beginning. Uh, but do you have any, so how did, what first got you interested in hats, like menswear, stuff like that? Right, so right, right. When did you first get into that? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact year or, or time. Um, I grew up in Orange County and I was born in Colorado, um, and then moved up to Santa Barbara and then now down to Los Angeles and stuff like that. So I've bounced around a little bit, but growing up in Orange County, um, there isn't much sense of of style or fashion or anything like that. It, it's more like you kind of do what everyone else does. There's not really a sense down there or anything like that. So I think growing up, coming into high school, um, getting out of high school, and just kind of finding myself is kind of where I found my own sense of, of style and stuff like that. Um, I think for my sense of style and the company and the hats and kind of where it all stems from was somewhere along the way um, I kind of found this fascination and this appreciation for the past. So like the, you know, early 19th or 20th century, excuse me, um, I guess late 19th century as well. Um, And I think fashion and hats and stuff was more of a secondary thing. The the first thing that caught my eye with it all was really how life was lived. Um, Just the culture, just um, 
the the integrity of people, just really just the culture of life. Um, and so from there, I think music kind of came from that and film, watching, you know, silent film, you know, starting with Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keen, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then progressing into deeper into music. And then from there, kind of once I started diving deeper and deeper, then came all the fashion, like why were these guys and ladies dressed differently? Why were they always top notch? Why were they, you know, always wearing their top shelf stuff? Um, and then from that came, why is everybody always in a hat? You can look at any old family photo. You can look at a store photo. You can watch old film pictures, uh, album covers, you know, of like Fats Waller and stuff like that. just always in a hat. And, um, so to me, the hat started to become symbolic of those eras because you saw the hat everywhere. And so I guess that's where, um, the kind of hat for me came into my life and stuff like that, you know, symbolically of the early 20th century, um, and that's kind of where the fascination and appreciation for hats came into play. Okay. Um, and so what is, what is the process of actually making the hats like, and what is kind of your design philosophy um, yeah. with them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so making the hats, um, there's a number of processes and parts and puzzle pieces that go into making a hat. Um, I mean, the way we do it, um, and myself, and I have an apprentice um, from Japan, and he's kind of learning and helping me out now. And um, so the way us two do it is very traditionally, very um, much done completely by hand. We don't have any machines in the shop, no sewing machines, no nothing. So you most, of, I mean, if you were in the shop, you'd be able to see um, behind us is a big block wall um, that houses all of our blocks. Um, for people that don't know too much about hats, that may know a little bit about shoes, kind of like a shoe last, how a shoe is kind of built in form, kind of same thing for hats. Um, and so first you pull a piece of felt over the block, it gets nice and hot, wet, steamy, and then, um, you pull it, let it dry, and then it goes through a number of processes to get the felt down nice and even and soft, smooth to that nice, you know, velvety soft finish. Um, and then we cut the sweatbands to the customer size, all that kind of stuff. Sew it all in by hand, do the ribbon shaping, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a very quick snippet. We can get into detail if you want to, um, on those exact processes, but then the design philosophy, um, it's funny, I had another interview with somebody in Italy recently, and um, they asked kind of a similar question. And it's really fun for me because I think as much I can give my expertise and opinion and whatever when it goes into designing a hat for a client, um, I truly like to think that the client that's ordering the hat is the designer. Okay. Um, and I do my best to give my opinion and say, I don't know if that'll work too well, or maybe you want, might want to switch this or whatever. But at the end, I really think that they're the designer because it's their hat. Mm-hmm. They're the ones coming in with some sort of an idea. Um, and we kind of lay that groundwork and the foundation and whatnot. So a lot of people, when they come in, they um, have a photo from something they found online. Oh, that's cool. Or yeah. their grandfather's hat um, that doesn't fit them. And they want it kind of reproduced and replicated to something that fits them that they can wear. And they can put their grandfather's name on the inside to kind of carry that heritage of their family throughout, you know, a new hat that'll last a very long time. Um, so that's kind of my deli- deli- design philosophy. Delightful. Uh, <laughs> it's delightful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I do my best to, to give my opinion. And then some people come in too and they say, I've never worn a hat. I know nothing about hats. What will work for me? And then we go through kind of shape, face, body structure, all that kind of stuff, what pinches and creases and proportions of brim and all that kind of stuff would um, suit their body type. But for the most part, I try and let them have full hand in design. I give my opinion in, you know, where I can. And then in other times, you know, I help as much as I can with whatever questions they may have. Okay. Yeah. And so I was going to say, like, you know, if you, if you were to come to the store, and we'll have pictures on the blog post of this, um, but... Yeah. Sorry, I'm like... We're trying to figure out the audio. Yeah, we're we're looking at it live, and so I'm like getting closer. Speaking of live, I'm going to go on to see if we're getting any questions. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, But if you go to the store, you can see that there's like a variety of different different hat styles. Um, You know, obviously, they're all fedoras, but, you know, like the crowns crowns are different. I see a lot of women stuff here. You know, there's a bunch of different colors. You know, it's, it's truly a bespoke experience, you know, if you... I'm sure you would agree because you are the person that is doing this. <laughs> right. But I think it's I think it's always so cool. Every time I come in here, I'm looking at the different like options, you know. And it, when it first starts out, it's basically like like a round top. Right. Film. Right. Exactly. It becomes you know these different crowns, and I see like these round tops here, but you know I don't I don't even know how to what what you call them. You right. Know? Right. And right. I see the fedoras that I'm used to. Right. So it's uh, and no, it's it's just always cool. I was I was very. Uh, I was in love with it as soon as I walked in when we first sure. met, like, 
met officially like last year, I think. Yeah, somewhere maybe early 16 or 16, 17, <laughs> right? Yeah, because uh, for, for people listening, I think it was, uh, I was, I put a thing out on Facebook. I'm like, does anyone have vintage right, ties? Right, 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 right. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, I yeah. Take pictures of And Cody was like, you know, I've got ties. And so, yeah. <laughs> and I came in, and it's the first time I ever walked in here, even though he's, he's you've had the storefront for. Yeah, so we, we uh, I had my original little workshop, um, small store in Santa Barbara mm-hmm. um, where we started the company and then we moved here and opened shop um, here in the Pasadena area in uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, so. it's, it's funny, speaking of like, you know, you're talking about, oh, he's so close, but I've yeah. never been here before. Like we both, we both go to Joyride a lot and mm-hmm. if I recall correctly, they are always like, okay, we're going to some, you know, something down at like Wellama's. Right, 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 right. And I think <laughs> we were all, they were always like, oh, you should come when they like talking to both of us and we were like, I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that guy. <laughs> I'm not going to go. <laughs> well, no, it's just like, oh, it's kind of far. And, you know, I don't right. know what's, yeah. what's going on. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, because even before we started following each other, I would see, like, you knew you'd like my stuff. And I'm like, who, who is this guy? <laughs> Who's this you guy know? liking and my stuff? I think, at, like, I think inspiration, like, two years ago, like, I think you did recognize me. And we talked. Sure. I had I had no idea. Right, right, right. That right. was just my bad. And then, mm-hmm. and then I think... Last inspiration, we talked a little bit at the double RL thing. Sure, right. And, um... It was. I was like, oh yeah, this guy, this guy Cody's kind of cool, and then and then officially we like, you know, we became friends. And now more. I see you too much. Yeah, every, <laughs> literally every Saturday I'm here taking pictures. So if you look at Cody's Instagram, like ninety percent now. That's right. Is basically Ethan photography. That's right. Yeah. So uh, so we, you you meant you were I think you brought it up earlier. It was like a bespoke experience. So this is kind of a quick one, but when sure. a customer does come in to get a hat and mm-hmm. they say this is what I'm looking for mm-hmm. and you start making it is it is it kind of like you know a bespoke spoot or bespoke spoot <laughs> suit spoot. I love spoots <laughs> where there's where there's multiple fittings stuff like that or is it just um, like you, they come in give you a photo that's actually a good question yeah that's a great question um, I yes. mean it depends on the client um, if they're very local um, sometimes I'll bring them in for a second or third along the process not so much for an actual um, it, like a bespoke suit. So, you know, like I'll measure them with the tailor's tape up front. Um, and that's more so would be, I guess, in suiting terms, uh, made to measure kind of stuff because I'm just using a tailor's tape. The way that I can truly be a bespoke hat maker is, again, if you were in the store, you'd be able to see behind us um, a device called the Conformature and 4 million. Um, it was a device created about 1860 minus. Um, in France, and I got mine from France, and it shipped over to me. And it's a device that goes on your head. It looks like a, uh, yeah, some people say torture device, some people say steampunk something, but it's really just like a wood uh, device that goes on your head. It kind of looks like a top hat-ish, um, and all these kind of needles conform to your head. And it takes not only the size of your head, but the exact shape of your head, so all the bumps and crannies and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how we can be a true bespoke company versus just like custom hats, if that makes sense. Um, Does it fit like large? Yes, it, it goes over everyone. Small, big, you know, kind of conforms to that. Um, oh, wow. I've never used it on somebody like on a size eight. Um, eights are really, you know, <laughs> they're very big heads. Um, they're far and few in between, but I have made very, very big hats, even bigger than that. Um, but I haven't used the conformature on them. Um, that was a time ago before I got the conformature. Um, Sounds so weird. So anyways, it, I know it's kind of a funky word. Um, so anyway, so... Initially, I'll, I'll uh, do just the tailor's tape, the conformature, stuff like that. Um, and then if they're local and they're very, uh, I'm not 100% um, certain on the size or even though I measure them accurately, I can tell that they like their hat just to be a little bit more comfortable, meaning a little bit on the loose side, which is hard to accurately measure because it's just more of like it just feels right kind of thing. So in that case, if they're local enough, um, once I start making their hat, I cut the sweatband to the size, all that stuff, it's sewn together. I'll ask them to come back in and we'll put just the sweatband on their head, see kind of how that feels, make any adjustments we may need to. And then once the hat's completely done, or even if you come in and you're looking at a ready to wear stuff, it's not even a bespoke hat and you like something on the shelf, um, we can even make slight alterations with yeah, that yeah. just with a lot of steam. Um, that's, that's what Ethan did yeah. with his... Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So like when you came in um, and when anyone comes in, luckily the way that I build my hats, not luckily, it's by purpose, um, <laughs> the way that I build and construct my hats um, and just the, the high quality materials and stuff like that, um, they're made to almost self-conform. So over time, um, with natural heat and perspiration that comes out of one's head... Um, 
it's almost replicating steam. So what steam does, it opens up the fibers in the felt, um, loosens it, makes it more malleable, and then as it cools off, it dries to that shape. So steam, we have a very high quality steam um, boiler in here, and it kind of, I don't know, gives off a big bellow of steam. But even with just natural heat and perspiration that comes out of one's head, um, it kind of does that. So like we had an event in here last week, yep. was that right? Um, and a friend of mine picked up his custom hat um, at the very beginning of the event. He wanted to wear it for the night as his first kind of outing with the hat or whatever. And he loved how it fit. He said, you know, it was a little bit kind of pinchy here or whatever, um, kind of by his temple. And I said, okay, well, you know, I can completely adjust. I want you to be happy. But why don't you just wear it for the event and kind of see what happens? And because there's a lot of people a little bit warm in here, um, natural heat and perspiration that's coming out by the end of the night, he said it fit like a glove. It was just perfect. Um, and that just is due to... The, like I'm saying, the, the perspiration of the heat that's coming out, it loosens up the hat, mm -hmm. and as it cools off, it kind of shape shifts to your head and kind of dries back to that shape. So over time, um, even it depends on how often you're wearing the hat, but um, it'll start to feel better the more the hat is worn. So there's kind of a couple of different things. Sometimes it's just one quick fitting, and like that's all I need. Sometimes I will bring them in, and then sometimes it's like a last minute when they're picking up the hat, just so, some adjustments, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. there's a couple of different things. So sometimes second fittings. You know, the more and more we talk, it sounds like it's, it's very similar to like a, sh like a bespoke shoemaker, right? Right, because right. Because even over time with shoes, they end up loosening yeah. up. Exactly. And Which has a lot to do with leather. I mean, a lot of shoes are made out of leather. So leather conforms and shape shift as it breaks in. Um, and I tell people that too. I said, you look, this is a brand new piece of, or brand new piece of hat. This is a brand <laughs> new hat, <laughs> just like a brand new shoe. It needs to be broken in. Yeah. The leather needs to get softer and break in. The felt needs to become softer and break in. The material itself will soften just, you know, the, the hand, like the actual feel and texture of it will, um, you know, kind of break in. Same thing with the shoe. You know, it gets that patina. It starts to break in and kind of develops its own character as it's worn. So that's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Me and shoemaking, I have a couple of shoe um, maker friends, cobbler, stuff like that throughout Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And we have a very similar crafting uh, not policy, but just crafting idea and philosophy. Right. Um, our clients are kind of the same. We talk about, you know, even though we're making two different things and two different tools and all that kind of stuff, it's very similar to each other. It's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Let's get a quick audience question. This one comes from Jake Couple. Cupel? Hi, Jake. Jake is just asking, can you recommend the best way to transport multiple hats for travel? Hat box. Done deal. <laughs> there um, you go. It depends on, I would say, where you're, not like your actual destination, but like, are you doing car, train, airplane? Are you just trying to like walk to the store? Like, you know, like, what do you mean by travel? Um, but hat boxes for sure. Hi, by the way. Hello. I don't, I don't think I know you, but that's cool. Um, so hat boxes. So I have my own uh, hat box that we sell here in the store. Um, they're American made out of the East Coast. They're beautiful, beautiful boxes. Um, ours have a nice insert on the inside. Um, meaning that the hat kind of goes upside down, um, so the crown is facing down, the brim is facing up. And what that does is it prevents the hat from really moving around and getting banged up as you're traveling against the inside of the box. It kind of keeps it in place. Um, so when my wife and I travel, um, we put both of our hats in one box, and they're carry-on size, which is great. Um, so depending, obviously, on the box, you can find vintage boxes at you know flea markets, eBay, stuff like that. Um, sometimes those are a little bit flimsy. Um, ours are a very, very nice, high-quality chipboard, so they're a little bit more sturdy and strong, um, more durable. Um, so overall, I would just say hat box. Um, there's different types, like I said. You can find different ones at different places, sometimes other hat stores. Um, majority of the time, I have found that hat boxes these days are pretty cheap, uh, meaning just the overall quality and durability of them. Um, so that's why I'm pretty proud of ours to offer them to our clients. Okay. And who makes your hat boxes? It's a very small mom and pop company out of the East Coast called Sarah's Hat Boxes, um, and uh, yeah, they just little mom and pop, and they make my hat boxes. They're great. They, they look really. I mean, I, I remember one of my favorite pictures I ever took for Cody was like one where they're like sitting on the table, right? Yeah, and it's so great. And I, I mean, you'll, you guys will see it, but yeah. it's like a gorgeous, like kind of purplish, and yeah, like a brown. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, technically, when I order them, they're both brown. Quote, oh, quote. Really? <laughs> but one is a glossy finish and one's a matte finish. Oh, so the okay. glossy finish gives that purple hue, oh, which actually I really like. It's kind of elegant looking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they really are. I mean, I almost every day people walk in just to see the shop. And one of the main things they say is like, oh, hat boxes. You just don't see hat boxes really anymore. No. Or hats in general, hat exactly. stores. I mean, it's kind of the whole thing. But really hat boxes in, you know, nice high quality ones. They just, whether they buy the box or not, whether they like hats or not, they're just like, whoa, your hat, like, hat boxes, like that's crazy. And they just love them. So um, anyways, travel. Hat boxes. They also have like like really hard shell, like plastic 
crazy durable hat boxes. Those are more so um, you can fit like something like me if I'm traveling abroad or to New York for a show or something like that. I can put like six to a dozen to like 20 hats in one box and then I can check it under the plane. I don't have to worry about it. It's like very hard shell, almost like military grade, you know, box kind of thing. Um, but anyways, to answer your question, Jake, uh, hat boxes. There you go. All right. That kind of, you kind of at one point brought me in my next question. Yeah. You were talking about like, you know, there's not really many hat stores around, hat boxes. So a lot of guys are hesitant to wear hats just sure. because of, you know, the last couple of years, the reputation right. of people who wear fedoras and hats, stuff sure. like that. Kind sure. of neck beardy, nerdy guys. Right. So I mean, we are nerds. So we are, <laughs> um, but yeah. So so how 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 do you think guys can like pull off hats without looking ridiculous? Right. No. Totally. I think the first thing, um, in my opinion, would be to get rid of the stigma and the negative connotation of the word fedora. Um, I get a lot of even like older gentlemen coming in the store and ladies and stuff like that and say, oh, I don't want to be a hipster and wear a fedora. And they just it's that word that people insinuate and kind of connect with the word hipster, they almost kind of go together like brother and sister kind of thing for whatever reason. Um, and people just don't really understand what a fedora is or can be in the different styles and proportions. I mean, a fedora is a very blanket term. And then there's so many different types of fedoras and different, um, just everything. I mean, fedora could be really anything. Um, but somebody that, um, may be looking for something and not know exactly what they're looking for. Um, honestly, I mean, to me, a lot of people these days, guys, wear ball caps. Just like the average dad, Joe, whatever. Ball caps are the Spencer's go-to. Spencer's a dad. Yep. Spencer's a dad. I mean, I wear ball caps too. I mean, I'm just saying in general, you know. Um, so when they come in, they're like, oh, you know, I've my husband's been wearing a ball cap for years. I'm sick of it. I want to get him something different. Um, usually, I mean, we can sometimes jump into some sort of fedora or brimmed hat, at western hat, whatever. But usually the easiest uh, stepping stone is actually like a flat cap. Um like our friends Damien Montsevice and stuff like that, you know, the flat caps, just because they more represent a ball cap. They're not as tall. They're not as wide. It's just just something on your head that's not as big on your head, you know? So sometimes I'll start them out with a flat cap or at least just try those on in the shop first just to get them the idea of something on their head that's not a ball cap. And then we'll try on a couple different fedoras or Western styles or whatever we're doing. Um, but really the biggest thing um, I get and see is people coming in and say, I've, I can't wear a hat. You know, like, I just never look good in a hat. I don't like the idea of it, blah, blah, blah. And I think that comes from they've always tried on hats from hat stores these days. And I would say 95% of hat stores these days are, like, mass-produced, fairly cheap quality hats. And they just kind of have that small, medium, large thing. It's, you know, there's not really any rhyme or reason to the structure, the proportion, stuff like that. And they've never had a hat that fits properly, which comes down to how it looks on your head and have the comfortability. Um, and then the proportion of it. So... I say, you know, that's fine, but I think we can make you something or find something in here that you actually may like because you've tried on stuff that the brim may be too wide or too short and it just didn't work with your face so it doesn't look proper or the crown's too tall or too short or the pinch is too wide or too narrow, whatever it is. There's a lot of different things that people don't know. So when they come in here and they're like, oh, I want to place an order, we can be in here for two hours and they're like, I never knew any of this like existed with hats, you know? So I think there's a lot of different things that... Um, people don't know about when it comes to hats or fedoras or whatever that they think they could never look at or have never looked good in a hat but they actually can and will it just has to we just have to find the proper proportion and shape and style and all that kind of stuff for them does that answer your question i kind of lost track of what the actual question was it does yeah okay so uh, on the subject of like you know getting the right shape and everything right how does you know getting the vintage you know that right. whole the vintage look? Yeah. Does that come up very often with people like, oh, I want like a thirty style fedora? Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, period stuff we do all the time in here. Again, stemming from a, appreciation um, and like the foundation of the company coming from the '30s and '40s and stuff like that. Um, I definitely enjoy doing period pieces. Um, and when I say period pieces, for those don't you know, 1930s and yeah. '40s and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean. I also get a lot of people that say, oh, I want, you know, I'm, I'm starting to wear suits or whatever, you know, vintage suits and whatever, and I want like a 1930s hat. And they don't, sometimes don't understand what that means because in the 30s and 40s, the crowns were pretty tall mm -hmm. um, in comparison to today's terms um, of, of hats and stuff like that. The brims were a little different. The ribbons, the trims were a lot taller. There's a lot of different things that go into it. Um, and some people just aren't comfortable with that. Or they think they're not comfortable with it and they just have to find the right proportion. Again, maybe the crown can be just as tall, but the pinch needs to be a little bit deeper or a little bit wider to fit their fa uh, face frame. 
um, and then it works for them. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to period pieces, um, the crowns were a lot taller. Um, usually that means like a six inch open crown. And what I mean, open crown, you can kind of picture um, maybe like a bowler or a top hat, which is kind of rounded at the top. There's no definitive shape to it. Um, and then in, from an open crown, that's how all of our hats are blocked. They're blocked open, we call it, um, in hatter's terms. And then it's shaped and creased into whatever we're doing for that uh, particular client. So, um, this is, what were we saying? <laughs> what about period hats? No. Just, Does that answer just, the question or yeah. just in general? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, yes, people are coming in for vintage pieces. Also, some people like the idea of, you know, I want a 1920s style hat or whatever, but they're really like a pretty just like average guy or lady or whatever. <laughs> and yeah. they just like that term 1920s or 1930s. So we're going to kind of pull inspiration from that, but it's really going to be more a contemporary thing. So it's going to be kind of a hybrid of stuff. And we do that too all the time, you know, where it's kind of maybe we'll do more a contemporary style hat, but we'll do like a taller ribbon or maybe a true vintage 1930s ribbon just so that person can say 1930s with their hat, you know, like, yeah. oh, it's a fedora, but it's got like 1930s ribbon on. And that just makes it feel good, which is fine, you know. Um, and that's something, again, that I really, really, really enjoy what I do here is I was actually just talking to a client about this last night here, um, that every single person that walks into the store is different from the next person that walks into the store. Um, I may get a super... Um, purist in 1930s it's like 1930s or die kind of thing and they want like a, a hat um, and then the next person is just like a dad that just dropped his daughter off at ballet class and then the next guy is like a cowboy from up the street you know so each hat is different than the next each person is different than the next each interaction is different than the next and that's something that always keeps me on my toes and it's pretty fun to do so on, on that subject though uh, I was going to ask if you get any like common requests or common styles that usually you know, that pop up every once in a while. Right, you know? right, right, right. Is it dressy? Um, is it the Western kind of style? I mean, we do a, a good amount of Western in here. I wouldn't say that that's definitely the go-to for Wellama. Um, I think um, for whatever reason, I've uh, branded myself or whatever, the aesthetic, very, like, masculine and, like, um, classic or vintage or whatever, and that's fine. I mean, that is the foundation of this. That's not all of who I am and what we do. Um so I would say, I mean, any sort of just like traditional fedora, whether that's like a teardrop fedora, whether that's like a center crease, a diamond crease, whatever. Um, again, I said this earlier, but fedora is a very blanket term, but we do just a lot of fedoras in here. Um, whatever that type of fedora is, whether it's period or contemporary with a little bit of a shorter crown and easier proportions for today's terms um, of guys dressing up or just even like a relaxed hat. I do like a lot of fedoras that aren't very like dressy. So, um, you know, people come in, they're like, you know, I don't wear suits that much. I just want something that's kind of every day when I'm going to work, kind of going around town, maybe I'm going for a hike, just kind of a very versatile hat. Um, I would honestly say that's a lot of what we do, just like very versatile fedoras in here, whatever that looks like for that particular client. Okay, cool. I know that when we talked before, uh, I asked you like, what, what are some of the weird stuff you've been asked to do? Mm -hmm. And I know that yeah. some, you know, like musicians or celebrities right, right, will right, want, right. like, you know, I think you started to do, like, indigo dyed. Or uh -huh, experimenting right, with that. Yeah. So, like, what are some of, like, the weird Sneak stuff? preview is not out yet. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> breaking news. Breaking. Right here, right here. <laughs> indigo dyed fedoras. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, each client is different than the next. And it's so fun because um, even though it's not my favorite thing to do, um, something that's very hip and trendy in hat world right now and just in, in trend and fashion uh, throughout the world is, like, distressed fedoras. Um, it's like jeans. Yeah, yeah. honestly, yeah, kind of. So, you know, getting like a brand new hat and then having us distress it to make it look like it's really old mm. or... And how do you do that exactly? Uh, hat or secrets. Uh, uh, the magician never revealed <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, there's a number. Of, it depends on like how distressed they want it. If they want it just kind of lightly, you know, like it just got dropped on the ground or they want it to look like a train ran over it. You know, like it depends and on what they want. You just take it to the train. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. It's the real deal. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it just depends. There's a number of things that we do to it um, or can do to it. But um, so like kind of that age look, I always try and talk them out of it. Um, <laughs> Please don't ruin my head. <laughs> yeah. Just like, let it happen. Right. Well, well, to me what it is is um, somebody that sits in the office all day that wants to look like a cowboy. Mm -hmm. That's And that's fine. I get it. Right. But my idea is for me to build you a beautiful brand new hat and then come back to me in 15 years with its actual character. Yeah. You know, from you going on a hike or um, – <laughs> Two weeks ago, I had this guy come in. He he works late and stuff like that, so I had to meet him at the shop after hours to pick up his hats. And he got this beautiful, 
uh, kind of a cattleman, kind of westerny, just very unique but pure white hat. Um, and he also got a black hat, two of the exact same hat, one all black, one all white. And he comes in, it's late, it's kind of dark in here, and um, he's like, oh, sorry, I'm late, I just got done uh, fixing my motorcycle or something like that. <laughs> and his hand, yeah, <laughs> stud, um, <laughs> his hands are just, I didn't see him at all, but he goes to put on his hat and, you know, look at it, you know, okay, do we need to adjust anything, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the white hat has now become black. His hands are just <laughs> full of grease. And I said, or no, he asked me, he's like, so uh, how do I clean these or how do I prevent this? I said, don't wear your white hat when you just worked on your motorcycle. Yeah. Like, it, like it's as simple Quick as that. Fix. Yeah, exactly. But that's like what I'm talking about is like, let me build you a brand new hat. Come back to me and like, let me see it with that distressed character, but from actual wear, you know, mm -hmm. whether that's just like sweat and oil stains or motorcycle grease or you took it off on your lap and your cigar like dropped ash on it and now it's got yeah. a burn mark you know like actual true character that's that's what i'm here for but if somebody wants to expedite that and they're really adamant about you know that distressed look you know then we'll do it you know we're here to accommodate and um you know have fun with clients so there's mm -hmm. no doubt about it um so you know that distressed look that's kind of a rabbit trail but um I mean, even just like fun and crazy, vibrant colors that you wouldn't see every day. So I've done like a lot of just bright pink hats. Um, I'm working on something. Um, my apprentice and I just for fun, we're like, you know, let's do something different for the shelf just to kind of show clients um, a part of the ready to wear selection, like something just different. So we're working on like a bright orange, like, you know, tangerine colored orange okay. hat with like a turquoise band. Yeah. So like almost like Miami, like old Miami Dolphin colors, like okay. from NFL. Um, so anyways, you know, so different fun colors like that. Um, I've done like weird random shapes um, and styles and creases on hats that almost look like it was like half creased on one side and like a little dent on the other side. So it almost looked like a moon kind of thing. Um, weird brims. I mean, all sorts of different stuff. It's, it's been fun to work with clients and kind of do different things with them, whatever that looks like. So we've done a number of different things. But yes, um, sneak preview, we are doing or starting to do indigo dye. We sent some felts to Japan. Um, to get truly indigo dyed from an indigo farm out there, which is pretty phenomenal. We just got a couple samples back. We'll be uh, making those um, and uh, kind of debuting them at Inspiration next month. Okay. Um, and then Mark our your calendars, everybody. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that because yeah. yeah. I just watched a Facebook video about indigo dyes. So. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and then our hope is to do kind of. As long as once we actually get building and blocking and stuff like that, the indigo doesn't run and die and, you know, kind of kill all of our blocks and, you know, run on your face when you're wearing and stuff like that, as long as everything's cool. Um, the hope is to kind of do increments of like a dozen limited pieces kind of thing. And there's like a dozen per season or maybe a dozen per year. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. Um, they may come with a limited edition box that's included with the hat in this particular case. Um, and those are all still custom. It's just the actual felt is indigo dyed, so it's a very unique dye of the hat. And then we can still do whatever we want to the actual hat as far as the trim, the shape, style, all that kind of stuff. So we're working on that. Pretty excited about that. Um, but yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I hope that and answers so, the question. And so I know that, like, you know, from talking to Ethan, you're kind of moving away from trying to, you know, market to straight, like, you know, the vintage scene. Right, well, we right, right. On that first. So, like, yeah. clients, I'm sure that when right. you started, you wanted to go after the vintage Exactly, people. because, I mean, I was really into vintage clothing myself. Uh, I would say 90% of my closet was, you know, pre-60s vintage. Um, obviously, again, going back to the foundation was, you know, very quote-unquote vintage um, um, even the tools, you know, kind of everything. My, my mindset was very vintagey, if you will. Um, and, and for those of you listening, there is a pretty sizable vintage community here in Southern California. Right. Yeah. So, you know. Which I mean, we still do too. Um, you know, I have a collection of vintage hats in the store. I sell vintage hats. I've got the vintage ties. We sell vintage clothing in here, uh, from time to time, not like a vintage store, but you know, just a couple mm -hmm. eclectic pieces. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it definitely started with that. Um, I wanted to make, you know, vintage inspired fedoras and stuff like that. And we still do, um, for particular clients, but for the, f the last, I would say two years or so, since I moved to Los Angeles, maybe even a little bit before starting in Santa Barbara, I really tried to, um, drive all my energy and efforts into the vintage community. Um, like trying to advertise and market and do vintage trade shows and this, that, and the other. And the response that I got was. Um, not exactly what I expected, which now I understand a little bit more, but they respected and appreciated what I was doing, but I would, they would not purchase a hat from us because it wasn't a 1940 Stetson. Mm -hmm. I found that the vintage community can be a little bit 
too much of a purist community, if you will, right, yeah. where, like I said, it's like 1930s or die kind of thing where, um, you know, everything has to be head to toe in 1930s. Otherwise, I won't wear it kind of thing. Um, so I was like, OK, that's interesting. Um, and I started to see that over the year. So I've kind of backed out of the vintage community a little, not community as like personal life because I still have a lot of friends and, you know, we still do vintage events and stuff, but more so as the company um, because most of our clients are just average shows which is awesome you know like the mom the dad like I said they just drop their kids off at school and they want to come in for a hat um yeah I get you know the nice classic menswear guys too and the moms and you know fashion kind of people but I get a lot of just people that just want to wear a good hat and something that's going to last and they'll be able to pass it down to their kids and stuff like that which is awesome um so as a shop and as a company the foundation is still quote unquote vintagey but um my marketing ideas and the way that I've kind of designed stuff and going forward with ideas for 2018 and stuff like that. Um, we're kind of gearing away from vintage a little bit, even though inspiration and we'll still do trade shows like that. Um, but yeah, the vintage community, at least here in Los Angeles was receptive to what I would do and they would bring me their old hats um, to get restored and cleaned and a new sweatband in their 19, whatever it is, but they would never buy a hat from me. So I was like, okay, let's stop kind of marketing to them a little bit and let's go into a different market that we still enjoy, that I still yeah. love um, and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's kind of where it is for a company and same for myself. I mean, I unfortunately found myself getting into that same mindset of like 1930s or die. I was like, you know, I'll wear one of my hats, but everything I want to wear is like pure 1940s and I won't wear anything else. And I started like, you know, in my own mindset, like Cody, why are you doing this? Like, that's not really who you are. Yeah. Um, it was almost like I was following a trend. If I'm just being honest, like that's kind of how I felt. Um, so I was like, you know, what, what is my fashion like? What is my style like? What do I like to wear? And it's kind of a mix of things. You know, it's wearing a pair of 1940s trousers with uh, an OCBD or whatever it is, you know, or like a, a vintage tie with, um, you know, a, mare, a, mare, a pair of modern trousers or whatever it is, you know, just kind of like. modern trousers. Exactly. That's what I'm, I'm saying. A pair of modern yeah. trousers. Yeah. I'm also not only, yeah. you know, curating my own style, but I'm also creating my own vocabulary now. Oh, so, great. yeah. So look out for Neil the dictionary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's coming Breaking out. Breaking news again. <laughs> um, so that's, it's kind of like a personal thing. And I think that's because I am the face of the company. It's pretty much only me in here doing every single aspect of the company. Right. My own personal life flows into the company and then overflows into the clients and kind of the aesthetic of the shop and the company as well. So I've kind of switched up my own thing over the last year or so. Um, and even more so recently in the past few months. Um, and I think that's also reflected the shop a little bit in a positive way. And so, sorry, but yeah, so speaking about like how things have kind of changed, or yeah. I, don't, I don't think this is something that has necessarily changed, but for people listening, when they, you know, we're talking about wearing a hat shop, you might imagine that there's only hats here. That's not the case. This is kind of a shop where it's, it seems like you're just kind of, you know, curating different like artisanal exactly products, like high quality handmade stuff in here so is that is that something that was fairly recent or when you opened it down here was that no when i opened i was uh from the get-go i was you know carrying other things and that's kind of where i found i stopped myself and i said cody why are you becoming too much of a purist kind of thing um because i think being like a purist vintage kind of person um can at least for me i'm speaking only for myself that i started um because i'm an I'm like a craftsman and artisanal whatever, you know, kind of thing. And there's so many other craftsmen out there or at least companies and brands and people that have their own passions and desires and dreams and companies and things they want to do and are doing that, you know, like why not support them? Why not like instead of just buying all 1930 stuff, which is like fine, like why not support somebody that's going after what they want to do, which is what I'm doing kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know? So exactly right. So, I mean, the idea of the shop was, yes, it's the hat shop. Yes, I make the hats in the shop but also to have kind of a, I don't know, old school haberdashery kind of thing, which the term haberdashery kind of by definition is like men's accessories, which hats fall under that. Um, so yeah, I mean, from the get-go, before we were an open shop, I was already ordering product from um, other craftsmen and companies from around the world. So um, like my one of my best friends in Santa Barbara, um, Alan of Steelhand Fine Goods, uh, he is a wonderful, wonderful leather craftsman. Um, so we have like wallets, belts, stuff like that from him. Uh, we got some bespoke umbrellas from the north of London, um, Lockwood umbrellas, so we got some of them in here. Um, Take that, know. Fox umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, yeah, like Lockwood's a much smaller company, but they're doing phenomenal things. They're in a lot of stores around the world. Their craftsmanship is just something I've really never seen before. I've seen a number of umbrellas and companies throughout the world. They're just really spectacular. So really working and curating a store um, 
with other like-minded brands and companies from around the world um, has been something that's really fun for me and something that I really desire and you know to bring into Los Angeles. Even like local stuff, like a local company here, very small, pretty dang new in the last few months, um, called Coats with a Z. Um, it's actually Radical. yeah, <laughs> super cool. Um, she actually started the company because she was making coats, um, almost like kimono inspired Japanese kind of like pullover, just long coat kind of things but out of um, like African strip weave cottons and really cool like Japanese materials and stuff like that. So that was like her first thing was the coat and then she made the baseball shirt and then uh, another type of shirt and another type of Komodo. Anyways, um, so we carry a couple of her baseball shirts in here. So it's really fun to work with other companies like that, small brands. So on the mention of Japanese, you know, I feel like that's been a big thing with your company, especially right. you know, fairly recently right. with the inspiration and everything. Right. You know, your, your uh, I'll say I was going to say Akira was inspiration, but Akira <laughs> is your apprentice. Right, right, right. You know, and then just last uh, last week, you know, we had Clutch Golf. Right. You know, and he was wearing one of your fedoras, too. Right. And so, so how do you feel about, like, the whole Japanese influence kind of coming in? Like, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, I talk about that. A lot of people always have the questions about that, and it's cool. I mean, the Japanese culture and heritage and style and fashion, um, you know, pulls from a lot of American heritage and American classics and stuff like that. Whether you should it's, read Ami Tora. That's a great book, by it, the way, guys. The, the Plug. Wow. The flag. That's our, that's it our is sponsor. though. That's yeah. <laughs> no, it is though. It really is. So I mean, yeah, it's been fun. I mean, I kind of started uh, getting recognized and recognizing Japanese and stuff like that back in um, uh, 2000. I think it was 14 when I first did Inspiration in New York. That was the first Inspiration that I did was in New York. Um, I got invited to go out there, so I said, you know, let's do it. Um, let's fly out there and showcase a little bit. And it's funny because Akira and I were actually talking the other day that. Kosuke of Clutch Golf was there and I saw his booth. I had no idea who he was. I didn't even meet him. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And that was like the first time I saw stuff was in New York. So anyways, um, but Inspiration New York, that's kind of where I got um, involved at, you know, Double RL and then um, Clutch Magazine, all that kind of stuff. And then coming back to California, just kind of relationships kind of curated and formed and stuff like that. And somehow became really good friends with the folks at Clutch and um, some other companies and people in Japan. Um, and then, yeah, Akira found me along the way. I was selling at Rose Bowl for about a year um, when the store first opened here in Pasadena just to kind of, it's like a marketing tool, just almost like a billboard at Rose Bowl. It, for those that, that don't know Rose Bowl, it's like a uh, very popular, highly curated uh, flea market of some very fine goods. Um, That's another sponsor. sponsor. <laughs> There's another sponsor Rose Bowl. Who, yeah. who, who's the... Uh... It's like RC events? RC Canning, yeah. There it is. That's, thanks, RC. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyways. Um, and then, yeah, Akira moved to Los Angeles a number of years ago um, for the culture aspect, but also to try and learn hat making and stuff like that. So he initially found me and approached me and kind of started hanging out a little bit and then uh, kind of approached me about, you know, kind of start hanging out more and, like, learning a little bit. And we talked about it and... Yada yada. A few years later, you know, he's here with me um, three, four times a week, and he's doing great. Um, he's going to be moving back to Tokyo uh, later this year in 2018, I believe in September. Um, oh no! Yeah, so I'm pretty bummed about that, but uh, also super excited for him. So, anyways, yeah, I mean, the Japanese style and culture it's been it's been a whirlwind. I mean, it's so interesting to me to always find and see and meet different people from Japan. Um, the stores, I mean, everything is so well curated in Japan so well done in Japan as far as the detail and attention to quality of the actual garments that are made. Um, it's really inspiring for me to see that and to work with folks like that. It's pretty dang cool. I mean, because uh, you are featured in like Clutch Magazine, Men's File, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think that's that's really awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just like Maiko, right? She was, yeah, she's my favorite person in the world. <laughs> She's also a photographer, so I feel bad because, <laughs> come on now. Yeah. But I think that's, that's really, really cool. I feel like you're being recognized a lot. Right. And, uh, so how, how has that been for you, like getting recognized, you know, with the past two, three years, like, you know, just kind of growing exponentially. Right. Notoriety-wise. Right, right, right. Um, like I said, a whirlwind. It's been fun. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's always, you know, exciting and I feel honored by it. Um, I don't feel like there's anything crazy that I've done to, um, deserve you know some of the the editorials and stuff like that in these magazines that they've done and um i just kind of put my heart on my sleeve when it comes to the company and the shop and my hats and 
Um, it's been cool to see people admire and respect that. And then that comes into stuff like you're saying, you know, with people from Japan recognizing quality and stuff like that and seeing other artisans in America and um, appreciating that and then kind of forming these relationships and doing editorial pieces and stuff like that. So it's been pretty cool. It's a pretty big honor um, to do something that you love and you're passionate about. And you're just really in here working every day, having fun and people respect that and want to write an article on you and I'm like all right that's cool cool podcast and super cool podcast you know so it's a yeah it's a pretty big honor so on that note I know that you've uh, been working with Bryceland's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. recently yeah Uh, for those of you don't know Bryceland's is my favorite and I think one of Cody's favorite Mm -hmm. run by Ethan Newton and Kenji Chung um they were based in Tokyo, I believe, mm-hmm. and they yeah. have kind of like this vintage meets modern thing, which really appear, appealed to all of us. Yeah, right here. So t- tell us what, what that was like. Yeah, I mean, it was it was great. Um, I've known about Bryson since they started. Um, I met Ethan at Inspiration New York um, when I was first out there. That's kind of where we first, you know, shook hands and said hello. And um, I think from there we've kind of just known about each other. There was no real. Um, relationship formed or anything like that until this last year um, when we really started talking just about hats um, just kind of what I'm doing out here and all that kind of stuff um, but yeah it's been phenomenal to work with them because they understand a lot they're very knowledgeable when it comes to tailoring um, and style in general um, and I also really admire and respect almost like what we were talking about earlier combining vintage pieces with um, high-end tailoring um, contemporary men's wear, all that kind of stuff. So, and that's something I feel that they nail on the head, and they're one of the only ones that I feel that truly nail it on the head. I think there's other people in stores that try it, um, and not that they fail; they just kind of do it in their own way. But I think Bryceland's, Ethan and Kenji, um, and their teams really just nail it. They really do. Um, I mean, the tailoring that they bring in um, is just top notch. Um, the shoes, the accessories, everything that they're doing is just right on point. Um, so it's really, really been an honor to work with them. Um, it's probably one of my biggest. Yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say like, so what? Did, what have you made with yeah. them? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so they approached me. I don't know earlier or kind of mid to end of seventeen um, about hats um, because they wanted to get hats in their store. I think they have a couple of vintage hats they sell from time to time, just like I do. Um, but they wanted you know to stock hats in their store, um, as part of their accessories and their tailoring and all that kind of stuff. So, um, we chatted a little bit. Um, wholesale's always kind of been tough for me. Um, just the margins and stuff like that with everything. It's, it's just you making it. It's just me making the hats. The materials themselves per hat are extremely expensive. The time that goes into them um, are a lot of hours. Um, so the margins for wholesale have been hard for me. But Bryson's kind of pushed me out of that comfort zone because I've known about them. I respect and admire them. So I said to myself, you know, how can I make this happen? You know, what, what do I have to do um, to make this happen? So I kind of figured it out. I pitched to them and they said, okay, let's do it. Let's try it out. Um, So they opened their second location in Hong Kong um, at the end of 2017-ish. And the first batch of hats went to there for their grand opening and stuff like that. So it was just an honor um, when Ethan approached me and to work with them to kind of design the hat. It was an honor for me too. (laughs) (laughs) That's the fun thing too, I mean, with wholesale and to work with Bryson's and stuff like that was to, um, you know, they're still not mass-produced hats. You know, they're still not just random hats, model A, B, C, and D for you to choose from. Um, Ethan and I were able to design the hat specifically for Bryson's, the colors, the proportions, the styles, um, you know, get the Bryson's name on the inside sweatband, all that kind of stuff. So it's truly a hat tailored to Bryson's that they get to offer their clients. Um, and that's pretty fun to work with. So, yeah, when they approached me, I was honored. I made it happen. We talked, uh, we designed, and uh, we got it going. So, yeah, we made that first batch for Hong Kong. And then, um, and then right now, as we're talking, I just finished... Uh, one style hat and the second style hat is on the blocks drying over the weekend um, and will be shipped to Tokyo for their Tokyo location next week. So both stores, store, stores, stores will carry uh, Wellama. And um, yeah, and then also the hope, and we've talked about it uh, with Ethan a little bit, is to actually get out to Tokyo, possibly Hong Kong as well, do like a little mini trunk show, but also you know be able to actually measure the clients in Tokyo and Hong Kong, have their clients um, get a unique experience with hat making, measure them up, get a custom hat instead of just the couple offerings that they offer in the store uh, for their ready-to-wear stuff. So we're working on that as well. But, um, yeah, Bryson's fantastic people, great people to work with. So what are the two models? You said two models. Right, right yeah, so the two they? that we've done, um, kind of like a traditional, they're both kind of period pieces, um, just meaning taller crowns, stuff like that. Um, the first one was kind of modeled after like a 1940 Stetson Open Road, kind of like a taller center crease, uh, silver belly, silver belly color, so silver belly felt, silver belly trim. 
Um, belly. Just a silver belly hat, a very bellyful hat, um, which was really fun to work with. Again, period pieces we love doing. Um, so that was great. And the second hat was like a brown on brown hat uh, modeled after Bogart in the Maltese Falcon. Mm. Um, that's kind of the idea that Ethan originally pitched me. He's like, this is like my idea of like the quintessential fedora was Bogart in the Maltese Falcon. So I said, all right, let's do it. Let's make it happen. We kind of fine tune a few things. And then um, so that's a brown on brown uh, kind of diamond creased fedora. Um, so they have that center crease and silver belly, diamond crease and brown. Um, I was able to uh, get some vintage trims for them. So both all the hats are made out of uh, like original 1930s and 40s trimmings and stuff like that. So they're really top notch hats for them. I'm pretty proud of them. And um, yeah, it's been really cool to see the hats on their shelves. That's so cool. It will be my honor to take pictures of them. That's right. You know? <laughs> um, so on that note, so we were talking about how you started working with Bryce Lens, how you get this notoriety. How does it influence your personal style you kind of got this a little right, earlier changing right. it up from full 30s and 40s right right yeah. right but, so what, what is your aesthetic now is yeah right, right exactly. now if we can if we can talk about what you're wearing yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. It, cause, you know the, i don't want this to sound like a backhanded compliment but you do have like a very unique style that i really sure. like because you know like it's it's not quite classic menswear because there's a lot of like seems like how dare wear. you <laughs> <laughs> right, there's right. a lot of like workwear influence in there mm-hmm. too mm-hmm. so i was yeah so ethan thank you for asking my yeah. question but I was yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. just going to ask like, what is your like when you get dressed in the morning what's you know, what are you kind of going for and your inspirations as yeah, well exactly. right yeah 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 um, I don't know I find myself to really be my own person mm-hmm. um, which I love so I mean one day it may be a little bit more classic you know suiting kind of stuff one day a little bit more workwear inspired one day kind of just like casual I don't know, Ivy 60s, just yeah. whatever, like, you know, and, and mixing and matching all those pieces. I'm not too big into workwear, like denim and stuff like that. I've got a phenomenal pair of denim um, trousers from uh, Dawson Denim in Brighton, England, in the UK. Um, again, people in Europe, Asia, stuff like that, they're just doing it right, man. Their quality, it's just, anyways, the plug for Dawson. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's really a mixture of things. I mean, yeah, Bryceland's, I wish I could buy every single piece from them and just have it in my closet because, like I said, I think they nailed it. Hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Some cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, they're just really nailing it um, from accessories to full tailoring to, uh, you know, everything they're doing is just right on the money. And that's something I definitely pull inspiration, you know, when I see what they're doing out there and the products that they're releasing and the companies they're working with and stuff like that. Um, it's cool to see that. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Like I said, it's kind of a mixed match of stuff, and someday it's a little bit more casual just because I'm in the shop. I mean, yeah. I'm in my shop six days a week, mm-hmm. long hours. Um, I take Sundays off to be with my family and whatnot, but, um, you know, it's a lot of sweat in here, a lot of hot steam and irons and stuff like that, and I don't feel like ruining some of my nice clothes or not only that, but I just don't feel comfortable working and sewing for hours and hours on end and sometimes in suits and ties and stuff like that. Um, and that's just my personal thing. So sometimes it's just like an untucked, like I am today, like an untucked, just casual, like 60 shirt mm-hmm. with a pair of trousers. Sometimes, yeah, I'm in a suit and tie just for fun, um, you know, to present that to people and, you know, to truly, um, I don't know, respect my shop and my company, what I'm doing here. But it's really, I mean, each day is different than the next. I mean, I kind of just wake up and, okay, like, what am I working on today? Like, what am I doing in the shop? That definitely determines what I'm going to wear for the day. Um, do I have clients coming in? Do I have appointments? Do I have meetings elsewhere outside the shop? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then that kind of influxes what I'm going to wear for the day. But yeah, I mean, did you want me to talk about what I'm wearing today or no? I mean, yeah, if you sure. want to, yeah. Just really quickly. Because yeah. like right now you're wearing like a, like a Harrington-ish kind of a jacket yeah. with the Bergenberg. Uh, yeah. You know, Really nice, uh, yeah, really nice, real yeah, exactly, all the plugs today, um, <laughs> like a nice cashmere um, wool scarf from them. It's like multicolored, you'll see it, it in the pictures. Yeah, but. it's really cool, um, definitely kind of some like mid-century modern art influence with the scarf, which is why I was drawn to it, um, like a casual like 60s short sleeve uh, shirt, um, some 2120 loafers, some white socks, and then um, some trousers from the Scott Fraser collection out of London. Um, and again, that's a mix of artisans, vintage, uh, and my own kind of just take on it all, putting yeah. it together. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's wearing a pair of like 40s trousers like the other day with, um, I was wearing a Bryceland shirt, um, an OCBD, and then um, a coat from a company in London called Private White. So again, mixing, matching stuff. So I mean, I like to mix and match. Sometimes my suits mostly are pure vintage, um, which are fine. I've got a couple jackets that are modern and stuff like that, more contemporary menswear. 
Um, it's, and it's all been fairly recent because I mean, we've been right, discussing this exactly. off podcast about how you've been trying to you know move exactly forward. classic menswear, Bryceland's ish. Exactly, kind of just kind of like you know getting rid of that pure vintage mentality, getting rid of some vintage, buying some new pieces from um, companies that I've admired for a long time, but I've never really wanted to personally wear you because it wasn't vintage. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's really like Scott Fraser uh, stuff from Bryceland's. Um, Bergenberg. I mean, of course, like I said, I'm just wearing their scarf I recently got. Um, even like shoes, like the 2120s, I would never wear these before because I wanted to wear my 1940s, yeah. you know, uh, shoes all day and like that was it. Yeah. Or maybe like Pia Flyers, like for sneakers and casual. Um, but now I have an array of other companies like Red Wing and uh, White's Boots out of Spokane, Washington and stuff like that. And if you're listening, by the way, this is a free podcast. So <laughs> if you guys want to jump in and be like, hey, yeah. advertising, yeah. let's do that. We will <laughs> so, gladly yeah. take your money. <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> or funny. Free stuff, you know, whatever exactly. you want. Right, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just way too many cool companies and stores um, in Los Angeles and throughout the world to. Uh, for myself to purely fixate on vintage. Um, One of my favorite stores in Los Angeles is called County Limited, um, County LTD, and they're kind of more Japanese-influenced, mid-century modern, some wonderful art in there, some furniture pieces, um, and then Lady White Co., um, they started with just the white T-shirt and then kind of progressed out of there. A lot of really high-quality T-shirts, thermals, jackets, stuff like that. That's kind of their little um, flagship store, too. So, I mean, Lady White Co. have enjoyed wearing um, their accessories. Um, yeah, there's just too many, too many stores and cool companies out there to fixate on vintage. So it's been fun to mix and match these wonderful brands and stuff like that and uh, cultivate my own little style and what I'm doing here in the store. That's super cool because we've also talked about this before, like how I've gone through the same thing of going from super vintage all the yeah, time yeah. to kind of, just mixing and matching, right. you know, brands that I, I can afford, maybe. <laughs> right, you sure. Know, and, and, of course, mixing and fifted stuff and kind of creating my own style, which I, you know, is Ethan's style. You right, know? And right. And you've got Cody's style, which, right. is, again, is a mix of different stuff. I think that's, right. that's super cool. And we talked about this last episode where Spencer is going through the same exactly. thing. Exactly, right, he's yeah. He's like, I need to like a year ago, just a year redo ago, my wardrobe. I mean, yeah. I wear this outfit yeah. right here. It's like a 70s, like Brooks Brothers, Red University Stripe, Levi's 1878s, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then some Ralph Lauren Petty Loafers. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I feel like I've worn this exact thing yeah. at some right. point. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah. I just think there's too many cool um, brands and too many just cool individuals and people. Influence is cool to like look at somebody else's style and be like, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. It's another thing to copy their style because it's theirs and not yours. I mean, yeah. you can pull influence, but I think everybody's so unique and uh, like, created to be their own person and whatnot. So, I mean, pulling influence is awesome, but I think just being your own person is even better, you know, whatever that is. So, you know, make your own style. I like to make my own style mine, whether you guys like it or not, I can care less. It's mine. You know, whether some high end fashion person at GQ likes what I'm doing or not, I can care less. You know, it's my own things. People will like it. People won't, but really making your own style yours, I think is super important. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kind of go with when I wake up in the morning. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So for our, our last question, I just want to kind of go into like what's what's in the future. I know yeah, that you've exactly. been doing. Yeah. Did I read your mind? You you, you oh. read my mind. That's a song from uh, <laughs> Superman. So did you did you know that the love theme from the original Superman <laughs> was lyrics? Yeah, that was yeah. Here so we go. It was Rabbit by trail. John Williams, and then they added lyrics to it, and it's called "Can You Read My Mind." Also, really? the Cantina okay. song from Star Wars has an official name, isn't it? Doesn't it? Oh yeah, it's like it. something. It's like love something. Love is in the title. Okay. Yeah. This is well, for our, our secondary podcast, right? Uh, Ethan and Spencer talk score. Of <laughs> um, but yeah, so you've been talking. You know, we, we, we've right, been talking about right, the right, right, guide stuff, right. doing a full sale with Bryceland right. a little bit. So yeah. I know you did go on some of the stylism. Yeah. For yeah. our for our people. Right. As well. Um. So kind of 2018. Is that what the question is? Yeah. Basically. I mean, are there are there plans to like expand? Like, what are there? Brands, are you thinking? Like, is there anything in the works that you're kind of sure going to be um, or working with? Yeah, um, carrying brands, not so much. Um, at least, I mean, I'm always open to it. Just nothing on my mind right now. Um, I'd love to get a few of my friend Kosuke's pieces in here from Clutch Golf. Just like a couple jackets Does or something like that. Storefront? Um, he doesn't have a storefront. He's okay. got a killer little workshop in downtown LA. Um, kind of office we workshop. Did, we it's, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, I mean, I'm always open to stuff. It's just when I run every single aspect of the business from social media to branding to making the actual hats to running the store to cleaning the store to let alone my family and stuff like that, um, it's hard for me to focus on like, okay, what other brands can I bring in? What can I do? My brain's always everywhere doing everything. Um, 
so I think for right now, um, we're working on upgrading the shop a little bit. We're going to be putting in a new uh, wonderful shelving unit um, to house a lot of new hats to showcase them a little bit better in here. Um, that's coming up for that. Um, curating. I'm trying to think if there's any companies. I mean, we just brought in Knickerbocker uh, for the winter, just some knit caps, not so much their full clothing line. Um, if I'm, you see pictures of Ethan, he's usually wearing that, that blue bean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so Knickerbocker is a killer company out of Brooklyn. Um, we're good friends with AJ, who's one of the owners over there. Um, and uh, since it kind of fell into heads where we and we don't do any beanies or knits or anything like that, we decided to kind of carry a small selection of them for winter, which are now pretty much sold out, a couple left. Um, but we'll see what that looks like for spring and summer. Um, yeah, so, I mean, as far as the shop, it's pretty much just staying, just making hats for people. Um, we have our first baby on the way next month, so that's going to change up life a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what that looks like. I'm going to be taking just a couple weeks off and whatnot, so kind of regrouping for 2018. Um, we plan to do... My plan is hopefully, again, depending on the baby, to travel a little bit to other parts of the country and world to do trade shows, to work with other stores. Um, hoping to get to Pity and Showcase there. Obviously, it just passed, but next this time next year in January. I don't think I'll do summer. Um, just because I think that's a little too close with baby for a big, you know, international trade show like that. But I think January will be in pity, I hope, to showcase. Um, and yeah, really just working with other cool people, other cool brands. I hope to maybe do some collaborations with some companies, um, work with other stores, get well out there, and uh, yeah, keep measuring people's heads. Okay. So where can people kind of uh, get in contact with you or for the SoCal locals? That yeah, just call 911. Guys? Perfect. Yeah. I need, right away. I need a hat. <laughs> Stat. Yeah. Um, you can find us obviously on social media, Instagram. Um, we're not too much on Facebook anymore. We kind of just like forward Instagram to Facebook, but the company is on there. Uh, Wellema Hat Company, or I think it's just Co. Um, so W E L L E M A Hat Co. Um, for social media. Um, the shop is in North Pasadena in a little town called Altadena, um, 837 East Mariposa. Um, you then, can email me orders at wellamahatco.com and you can find all the other information online you can give okay. me a shout yeah generally what is going to be the price range because I know I'm yeah good question so it that. depends on material and which lies the quality of the hat if you want to do um, the introductory which is still a nice quality uh, felt for hats at a, like a European hair if you want to do pure beaver blend if you want to do dress weight western weight there's a lot of different things that go into it but base price is about three to six hundred give or take and can kind of fluctuate in and out of there depending on what we're actually doing to the hat uh, but most of that price is on material. You can find more breakdowns on pricing and the details of material online on our website. Um, yeah, that's kind of the pricing range. Okay. Cool. Great. Yeah. Anything else you want to plug at the end here? Um, a more, a more yeah, let me just go down my list of favorite we'll companies and brands bag. and people in the world. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, just keep an eye out if you want your head measured. Um, we do remote stuff, too. I've got clients around the world, country. We ship hats all over the place. You don't need to be here and come to the store to get fitted. We can work on that through email and telephone. Um, but, yeah, if you're looking for a hat, give us a shout. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Cody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, well, uh, you, you'll see all of his pictures. I mean, you just, We're, you've, there's going to be a... I post uh, a portrait of Cody, like, every like, <laughs> website. If, I've got, if I'm, like, slow in content, there's no blog post... I go into my folder of all the Cody pictures, and I'm like, okay, well, that's a good one. I'm going to put that. <laughs> yeah, but there's going to be a supplementary blog post for for the interview that we're probably going to see all the outfits yeah, that we described. Yeah, exactly, some of, the, yeah. some of the pictures of things that we talked about. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank thank you. Yeah, uh, thank do, you. Do you want to have... You want to come up with our cool sign off? We have a new, we have a sign off, a different one every single Because episode. we haven't come up with a good one. Okay. So. Well, like, I need to come up with yeah, one for you guys? Just, yeah, yeah. We're putting, putting you on the spot. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, Go make it good. Oh, wow. Well, you're just really. Um, uh, uh, style, and I'm going to direction out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. All right, perfect. Style, I'm going to direction out of here. We'll yeah. see you guys in the next one. See ya. Bye.